Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Robert Carnworth, and I've been invited to chair this session on legislation, regulation, and the rule of law. And someone has drafted a little explanatory text, which I think I must read. It says, the banal routines of law underpin progress on climate change. This session explores the now globally dominant approaches to governing climate change, relentless legislation, target setting, planning, monitoring and reviewing. If they are to contribute to progress, these approaches make significant demands of government actors and civil society and raise questions about how far the law can reframe often settled government norms of policy making. Uh, well, that's the challenge. And to answer those questions, we have three eminent speakers. One who's in the room beside me happily, the others dotted around the world, I think. I hope they're there. Are they? Probably there. You know, I'm sure they'll be come in due course. We'll start off with Sharon Turner, <coughs> who's sitting beside me. She's an independent consultant specialising in climate law and governance, visiting professor at the University of Sussex, but previously an academic based at Queen's University of Belfast, where she was a professor of environmental law for over 25 years. Uh, and she's a visiting professor at University College London. But she was also in Northern Ireland seconded into the first power sharing executive to act as senior legal advisor on environmental policies. She has other qualifications, but that's enough to get her going, I think. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and um, it's lovely to be here today, and it's particularly lovely to be here in person. I can hardly sort of believe I'm actually at an in-person <coughs> meeting, so it's um, rather exciting from several perspectives and to see lots of old faces and friends um, in person again, so that is a really nice experience from my point of view. Um, in terms of what I'm going to talk about this morning, I just want to make a few maybe introductory comments. Um, I am speaking, I suppose, from a slightly different perspective to the speakers previously in that I'm not speaking as an individual scholar, I'm not speaking as a direct activist, but I'm speaking as somebody who has worked on a particular model of law for what is known in the funder world as big philanthropy. Um, out there, uh, even though I spent many years as an environmental lawyer and working on these issues, I had never heard of the organisation called the European Climate Foundation prior to being recruited by them. But there are a small number of extremely large foundations um, that work across the world in close collaboration uh, to aggregate funding globally. And we're talking here about hundreds of millions of pounds, sometimes billions of pounds spent annually by these foundations together. And they collectively develop a strategy of action to orientate civil society um, towards certain asks. And what I was recruited to do almost 10 years ago by that foundation was to set up a new programme to focus on climate law and governance. And ECF was very, very unusual in doing this. It was the first time that a climate funder had chosen to focus specifically on the question of long-term climate approaches, long-term legal approaches, and particularly on minimum standards of climate governance that were necessary and that they believed were missing. And I suppose I was recruited as somebody with an expertise, but also recruited. I, they, they taught me to become an activist, and I suppose I shared my, my legal and research experience and also tried to build a community of practice on this, this issue. So even though I'm talking about the work that I have led for many years, I am standing on the shoulders of, I'm really speaking about the work that has been co-created with an amazing set of partners across Europe and the world, and an amazing set of funders who have been open to a very different way of thinking about the rule of law and investing in it and building expertise and understanding um, about it. But my subtitle there is a bit of a nod to, if anybody can read it, um, it's Virtue Signal, it's basically Climate, climate Change Acts, Virtue Signal, or cornerstone of an effective rule of law response. And I wrote that a year ago um, as a sort of a, an offhand remark to myself, but it was really a nod to, I suppose, my own reflection on the 10 years. Because when I started this work, uh, and when ECF started this work, 
the idea of long-term climate acts, the idea of long-term rule of law models and climate governance was resisted by many major actors in the field, um, not least by climate philanthropy itself, but by significant institutional and civil society actors. And sitting here today, looking back over the 10 years, it seems odd, but it has been quite a, it's been a substantial journey, I have to say, um, in the last decade. And I'm still not entirely sure what the effect of our work has been, but we are now, I think, moving, we're now able, I suppose, to move into a period of reflection and building the evidence base around what has actually been achieved. And these are not, uh, I don't know if you can actually read these slides. I've changed them substantially since I've written them also, so I'm going to just talk around these. Um, the idea of long-term rule of law models, what we would in the UK call the Climate Act, and what is more widely known within Europe and further afield as climate laws, um, even though it's a confusing term because all laws on climate are climate laws, but this idea of a long-term framework with a long-term target and a framework for managing policy development consistent with that <laughs> was a surprisingly disruptive model. And for, for a, as was a lawyer who began this work from a UK setting, it didn't seem so uh, unusual because we had had the experience of the campaign in this country for the Climate Act. But it was hugely disruptive um, in other countries and particularly at the EU level. And the programme that the European Climate Foundation set up, its, its fundamental focus was essentially to ignite the innovation spark that started in this country with the Climate Change Act. And we have worked mainly within Europe, I should say. Um, that's the first thing to say. The, the, the money that we had only enabled us to work within a certain uh, range of countries. So we focused on the development of law in Brussels, EU law, but also how national, the national paradigms that we're developing on a country by country basis. But we have also reached out across um, to, to partners and funders in other parts of the world, which I'll come, come on to in a moment. But I suppose the initial aim for the European Climate Foundation, I suppose our theory of change in the foundation, was to say that Europe had to lead. It was essential that Europe delivered on ambition and that it, its policies were ambitious enough, and that European credibility in global negotiations had to be real and had to be supported. And this was one of the strategies of action that the foundation was focusing on in terms of winning the laws that it believed would drive sufficient ambition at EU and national level. But it was a very disruptive paradigm in terms of the funder community, in terms of what funders were willing to fund, because even though there are, the, the money from climate action comes from many, many different sources, but philanthropic influence is enormous. And it is not a question of funders imposing a vision, it's a vision that is co-created with the field. Civil society and, and philanthropic actors work together to develop the strategy. But when I began this work, the, the money, as they would say, was very, very concentrated in campaigning to influence the EU ETS and also campaigning for short-term sectoral approaches um, to national responsibility. You know, energy, energy targets, renewables targets, um, energy efficiency targets, energy market solutions. And it was very much an energy question, even more than a climate question in some respects. So it was quite a different approach to take. And I was incredibly surprised by how resistant the European Commission was to this model in particular. Even though the European Commission had championed the development of the COP process and the UN convention making process and the journey towards Paris, which was very much concentrated on emphasizing the importance of long-term strategies and long-term approaches, the Commission and civil society in Brussels in particular, viewed this particular type of legislation as a threat to ambition, which seemed remarkable to me at the time. But there was such an orthodoxy that if you focus on near-term targets and sectoral targets and strengthening the ETS, that was the sort of silver bullet for ambition. 
rather than understanding that there were also other approaches that were needed to complement and to drive ambition within those approaches, and also, I suppose, to balance the role of carbon pricing more generally. So, in terms of the journey we've taken, what I, this slide tries to do is just to summarize, I suppose, where we've basically, what, we, what we've done and where we've got to so far in some of this. And I think that what we've done in terms of the first sort of section of points there is that we have worked really actively to win climate acts or climate laws, the long-term climate laws, in several countries across Europe. I mean, Britain had already done it. Uh, France was well on its way. Sweden was actively in, engaged in its own internal debate on this by the time we started to work on this. But we have now worked with several other countries, uh, building civil society capacity in Spain, Portugal, um, Greece, and several other countries to, to basically build a national conversation about the, the value of this approach. We also laid the foundations for the, the proposing of the European climate law. We worked very intensively to influence the, the EU governance regulation, uh, which was the first time the EU actually focused on a long-term uh, long approach. And we were deeply involved in campaigning on and influencing the European climate law itself. We were building awareness about the, the rule of law model, building capacity across, the, across civil society, um, building, I suppose, also a mapping of the political conditions that were needed to win these sorts of laws. And what we can say, I think, 10 years later, <coughs> is that framework climate acts are rapidly being recognised as a cornerstone of effective, an effective legal response to, to implementing Paris. And there is definitely real momentum behind this um, type of legislation. There are very, very widely, if you like, legal approaches that the models of climate laws across Europe vary, but there are lots of core conditions that we can see now um, emerging in different countries. Europe taking up this model, the EU itself was certainly a shot on the arm to the, to the uptake of it but it has still not replaced national appetite to have their own laws on this. And we can see that several countries now in the east of Europe and central and eastern Europe are working, are thinking actively about getting involved in this. And I think that one of the most interesting things looking back on this, this work and even looking at the momentum that's clearly building across Europe and further afield about why this type of legal approach is important is that the political community and civil society community are beginning to take greater note of three realizations about the transition itself, and that this type of law has a very, a very real significance to those realizations. Number one is that we are now in the era of we're beyond incremental change. If, you're, if we're really serious about Paris, we're talking about societal, profound societal change. And the change on that scale is deeply political. Carbon pricing is just simply not enough, that we need real political leadership, we need public consent and understanding, and that we need a framework, a governance framework, that fosters national ownership and fosters the political leadership to drive this sort of policy making and to drive the national conversations that are needed to actually deliver the, the outcome. And in that sense, I think that cl these, cl these types of climate laws have a real role to play. There's also the realization that government at every level has to be mobilized almost on a mission-led basis, that this is an enormous undertaking at a hugely accelerated speed, and that it needs a whole of government approach. And also in the era of, I mean, it, it, was, it was obvious when the, when the UK strangely adopted its own climate act, it, Europe was hit by a huge shock, the first financial shock, if you like, the financial crisis. But it is becoming more and more obvious that we are living in the era of successive shocks. And it is crucially important that we have resilient commitment mechanisms and climate laws play that role as well. Almost to try to unpack this a little bit further, and I'm conscious of time ticking by, what I'm trying to explain in this slide is, to some extent, a little bit more detail about why ECF has invested so heavily in this particular legal model. 
And it is, I think, a conviction that is not simply the foundation's conviction, but it's a conviction that we have discussed and tested and basically shared, co-created with a huge range of partners <coughs> across Europe, that this particular type of legal model mobilizes four very important policy management dynamics. The first is the dynamic of backcasting, that it is not, you, you will not get sufficient ambition if you're not developing policy in relation to the long-term objective. And that simply didn't happen within the short-term approach or the, the purely sectoral approach. If you didn't look across the economy and you weren't true to a credible long-term objective, you weren't getting the right level of ambition. I think the other policy management dynamic here is the importance of trust and transparency about the real policy options. And it's important for two reasons. First, to build, to empower the public to engage so that they can design their own transitions and get involved. But also to build understanding and leadership, not just in the party that's in government today, but in the parties that are going to be in government tomorrow. And it's this idea of building a cross-party political understanding that stabilizes political leadership. We are also working, I think, very, we're, we're very interested in the work that Professor Mariana Matsukato has been developing at this university in terms of the mission mindset, that this idea that if the state is directed towards a mission, if it is mission oriented, and in this case to net zero at national level, that it is a means of unlocking, you're creating the enabling conditions to unlock the power of the state as the single most effective policy innovator that's available to society. And I think the pandemic, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been a fascinating case study in watching how the state, if it, is, if it believes itself to be mission driven, can respond dramatically. And we are also very concerned to I suppose we, are, we also are very interested, I should say, in the role of this particular legal model in, in catalyzing national conversations and keeping that conversation going. And it's cre these legal models create an ongoing conversation. They, they make climate policy making routine, the reflecting on it, the examining about progress. And this idea of building a national conversation about are we doing enough, are we making progress, um, are we actually getting there. And in terms of where next, uh, this work, I mean, we started with a relatively modest budget. Uh, the budget has, because funders and civil society have responded to this tremendously, and we are now there is now, we're now being contacted by civil society to say we want to work on this type of legislation. The European Commission is very engaged with it. The European Parliament is engaged with it. The programme is growing and growing in itself. And we're able to drill down into the individual components of the legislation. We're building programmes on public participation, on, civil, on, on the advisory bodies, and all the elements of the climate laws, if you like. And I think we're moving into a period now of moving beyond the mapping. For a long time, we were, we were mapping the existence of the legislation um, and understanding the political conditions that gave rise to it, the commonalities and, and differences in terms of political economies and why different countries chose different approaches. But we are now in this process of building the evidence base about the impact and we're about to publish a substantial report on that shortly. But there has been a huge... <laughs> empirical study of high-level stakeholders across all of these climate law countries to find out what has been the reflection on the impact of this legislation. So that's coming soon. We are working with more and more new partners to build to, to win new, new laws of this type. And we're now deeply engaged in the Fit for 55 debate in Brussels, basically saying to the EU itself that your European climate law was an important step, but it's an unfinished story. And we are now looking to mobilize Europe's climate law countries to speak up in the Fit for 55 debate and to tell the story in Brussels of what they have learned from the experience of committing 
to this type of legislation so that EU rules can be influenced and that European rules can apply the lessons that those countries have learnt about why minimum standards of national climate governance matter. I should, we should stop there. I think I'm getting repeated, <laughs> repeated messages. But, uh, Sorry, we've got the, two other speakers here. There, there is certainly momentum, and I think there is commitment in the funder community to carry on. And it will be fascinating to see how far we get with the work going forward. Thanks, Robert. Thank you very much, Sharon. That was absolutely fascinating, and it would have been interesting to, and it will be interesting to hear more if we have time. Um, I've been told that Eloise uh, Scottford is waiting and would like to speak next, if uh, Andrew Jackson doesn't mind coming third. I haven't been able to talk to him yet, but Eloise, there you are, I think, and it, I don't think you need any further introduction than you had already, so far away. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm very sorry not to be there in person. I had planned to be, but I've ended up on the other side of the world um, where it's quite late at night. But it is um, an absolute pleasure to be here and to join. Um, I am going to speak about the same kind of laws that um, Sharon was talking about, but balance out her optimism and kind of drive with maybe a bit of, um, not pessimism, but critical reflection on uh, framework climate laws. Now, the title of my paper um, is The Disappointment of Climate Change Legislation. So a bit of a bleak title. Um, and I'd referred to the idea of legal limits to climate change acts, but I've changed my title slightly. And I'm actually, what I'm doing in this paper is investigating tensions between um, framework climate acts with long-term targets, as um, Sharon was discussing, tensions with that model of legislation and the rule of law, which is our conference topic. Um, and I'm invest investigating these tensions using the UK Climate Change Act 2008 as an exemplar. And it is a deliberately provocative paper. Um, in light of the fact that the rule of law risks being, as Judith, Judith Schlar warns, a self-congratulatory rhetorical device. And that means that advocating for the rule of law and for environmental rule of law can reflect assumptions about the law that it's inherently worthwhile, as well as reflecting aspirations for the law to do good. Now, rather than advocating for the rule of law, um, what I'm doing in this paper is questioning how the rule of law, as an ideal that underpins the UK legal system and many other legal systems, accords with the Climate Change Act. And I argue that frustrations with the Act and how well it's performing partly reflect a dissonance between the act and fundamental ideas we have about laws and about the institutions we have for delivering them. Now, the UK Climate Change Act is often referred to as landmark leading a model piece of legislation. It's praised for its legal ingenuity in tackling a complex and urgent policy problem and for the political magic that made it happen. Some, however, do feel increasingly uh, a real sense, a palpable sense of disappointment that its legal mechanisms are not translating quickly, quickly enough into policy action with adequate ambition. Maybe what um, the kind of tensions that Sharon was seeing in the EU about short term climate policies and longer term ones. Um, but this concern, um, I'm arguing, presents or raises legal and political questions um, about the Act's enforceability. Um, and avenues for this remain something a mystery on the face of the Act and in light of traditional mechanisms of legal enforcement, certainly within the, within the UK legal culture. Now, at the root of questions about the Act's enforceability and frustrations with the Act is something of a puzzle in jurisprudential terms. The Act's legal ingenuity is also legal novelty for which we don't yet have all the theoretical or practical answers and in relation to which there are some theoretical barriers. Now, in this paper, I will look at this jurisprudential puzzle through a rule of law lens. And I argue that the architecture of the act and particularly its focus on and addressing climate change, which is a collective problem through mandated coordinated policy action, sets up a model for legal control that at a minimum is inadequately theorized or more problematically, sets up tensions with dominant understandings of the rule of law and the separation of powers 
These tensions are particularly seen in considering how the nature of obligations under the Act, imposing duties on government to address a collective cross-departmental problem over long time scales, where those duties guide and curtail policy-making discretion, those kinds of legal obligations interact with at least four key rule of law principles. So firstly, that the law should provide adequate certainty for individuals, including corporate individuals, to plan their lives in accordance with the law. Secondly, that the law should be enforceable by an independent judiciary who can oversee that government is acting lawfully within its powers. Thirdly, that the law should be achievable in practice. That is, there's a realistic possibility of compliance with its requirements, supported by suitable official action, administering those rules. And fourthly, potentially, depending on which version of the rule of law you subscribe to, um, protecting individual or other rights as legitimizing underlying norms. Now, the, these four tensions between those aspects of the rule of law and uh, the obligations of the Climate Change Act, which I'll unpack a little bit more, are not the only ones that might arise in relation to the Act and the rule of law, but they essentially reflect the fact that the rule of law is a concept centered on protecting the individual against arbitrary state power, where the law is deliverable and where the stability of legal systems is prized. Now, each of these respects does not always easily align with the challenge of climate change or the architecture of the Climate Change Act in addressing it. So I'm gonna unpack a little bit more this rule of law puzzle in the Climate Change Act. Now, in one sense, the Climate Change Act embodies the rule of law par excellence. It's a statute, an ultimate expression of the law, addressing in binding, prescriptive, generalized legal form, the mandated approach to one of the most complex policy issues of our time. The legal nature of the act is empowering for citizens and government alike, and it represents a settlement of debates and a firm symbolic statement of the long-term direction of travel to address climate change, providing arguably certainty for business, citizens and government policymakers in organizing their affairs. It's a legitimate form of social control due to the reasoned protracted debate underpinning its enactment. Um, it, rep it expresses good and just law in a, in a kind of an Aristotelian way, and it pursues the common good. More recently, Joseph Raz's revised account of the rule of law emphasizes that the central objective of the rule of law is to exercise power in the interests of the governed. Now for a collective action problem like climate change, with wide ranging potential impacts across the community, both local and global, the act reflects this kind of vision of the rule of law as a legitimate legal expression of the common interest and the common good. However, the jurisprudential picture, I don't think is so simple. And that's because partly the rule of law is, as we've been discussing in this conference, a multifaceted concept, and climate change is a challenging regulatory target due to its dynamic and polycentric nature. It's also because since Magna Carta, and <laughs> so it's an entrenched kind of um, uh, understanding, the rule of law has been understood as a concept rooted in individual liberalism. And I know that Jeff referred to this yesterday. On whichever theoretical version of the rule of law one embraces, it's dominantly concerned with protecting the individual from arbitrary state power, prizing individual liberty at its core. Political philosophers like Hobbes and Locke did not question the link between promoting the enjoyment of private rights and the common good. And these very different political traditions continue to infuse understandings of the rule of law with a strong sense of individualism. Dworkin's account, of law in a democratic state takes this approach further, advocating that the integrity of the law requires that individual rights are afforded fundamental protection to avoid being sacrificed on the altar of community interests. On, a, even on an extreme view of individual uh, liberalism, Hayek argues that laws should operate to protect people from each other and without specific policy objectives in mind, and certainly should not pursue social objectives like addressing climate change that might compromise individual liberty. Now, the Climate Change Act is antithetical to this individualized understanding of law as the core tenet of the rule of law. And this is because the act is fundamentally a collectivist legislative project. It represents a relatively novel model of legislation 
as Sharon was discussing, <laughs> in addressing a collective problem through long-term obligations on government, not individuals, constructing public administration and governance through goal setting, plan making and expert oversight and controlling substantive policy making in the process. This legal framework creates a dissonance with ingrained understandings of the rule of law and has implications for the role of government that have not yet been fully embraced in the constitutional conventions of the UK state. Furthermore, there are different theories and models of the rule of law and on each, but, but on each of these theories, there are puzzling aspects for theorizing the Climate Change Act as a form of law. Now, I'm gonna look at these four aspects, just, but just the first two in some detail, because I don't have time to go through them all. Um, and I'm not advocating a specific theory of the rule of law, but I'm picking up on these different elements to show that when we dig into what the rule of law means or might mean, we'll see the fault lines between the Act's architecture and dominant understandings of and entrenched institutional foundations for our law. So I'm gonna um, dig into this first tension that I can see between the Act and uh, uh, fundamental ideas of the rule of law, looking at certainty, pr providing certainty for individuals in addressing climate change. Now, a central principle of the rule of law on any account is that the law should be stable and predictable, being sufficiently clear to allow individuals to plan their lives with confidence, including corporate individuals. Now, this function go of the law goes back to a Dicean conception of the rule of law, whereby no man is punishable except for a distinct breach of law established in the ordinary legal manner before the ordinary courts of the land. In this sense, the rule of law is contrasted with every system of government based on the exercise by persons in authority of wide arbitrary or discretionary powers of constraint. Now, the architecture of the Climate Change Act sets up an immediate challenge to this principle. It constructs, it constructs a scheme under which government has wide discretion to change social conditions radically between 2008 and 2050, and implicitly sanctions widespread impact on the rights and lives of individuals. This discretion arises due to the 2050 target in Section 1 and also through the Act's five-year budgeting requirements, which, whilst providing a direction of travel, do not prescribe how overall carbon budgets are to be met. The Act simply requires governments to set policies to enable its decarbonisation requirements to be met. This statutory framework is fundamentally at odds with an idea of law as rules which make it possible to foresee with fair certainty how the authority government will use its coercive powers in given circumstances and to plan one's individual affairs on the basis of this knowledge. That's a quote from Hayek again. Um, this kind of difficulty for individuals to plan is seen in relation to investments or assets that may become stranded or difficult to use in light of new government carbon policies. Similarly, um, certain existing industries may no longer be viable as policies outlining social and economic change, changes required to meet net zero requirements are implemented. Uncertainty in the legal environment has already been seen when carbon mitigation policies developed to meet UK carbon budgets, such as green electricity schemes are adjusted over time, sometimes quite abruptly, which has led to litigation. Now, the need for dynamic policymaking to pursue decarbonisation is in tension with the ideal of a stable regulatory environment, highlighting the legally disruptive nature of climate change, as Liz Fisher, uh, Emily Barrett and I have noted previously. The Act provides a legal framework normalising this dynamic policymaking, inevitably impacting individual rights in light of the deep tentacles of climate policy into widespread areas of regulation and policymaking. The net zero transition mandated by the Act implies costs for individuals that are not easily predictable and even if foreseeable, which are not necessarily feasible to plan for. Against this framing, it might be argued that the Act can be made consistent with rule of law requirements for legal certainty and predictability. Decarbonisation policies can and should be set in ways to provide lead times and thus some certainty for individuals and companies to plan. Um, and furthermore, the rule of law does not require absolute certainty. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm, I could talk a little bit more about that. Um, one way also that legal Two doctrine. Minutes, yes, I know. I know, Robert, but I maybe three or four. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you're um, on the other side of the world, it still applies. I know, you can't catch me here. 
Um, no, no, I will wrap up quickly. Um, but one way in which legal doctrine accommodates the dynamism of legal and policy development with impact on individuals is through public law constraints on, administ on administrative discretion. Um, but I think administrative law accommodation of individual rights with a changing regulatory environment does not fully grasp the scale of transition required by the Climate Change Act. Um, the second tension I wanted to talk about very quickly um, is about holding government power to account. Now, um, equality before the law, a central principle of the rule of law also applies to governments, and that has two implications for holding government to account. Government is required to act according to law, and its executive discretion is accountable through law to prevent arbitrary government, and there should be access to courts to ensure a mechanism for that accountability. Now, arguably, the Climate Change Act creates a model of constraining government power that is consistent with the rule of law's core principle of constraining arbitrary power. Um, and this is the argument that complex laws may offer refuge from the exercise of executive power um, with procedural um, constraints. Now, there's lots of procedural requirements, bespoke institutional account structures and accountabilities accountabilities in the Act, especially through the Committee on Climate Change. However, the point that I really want to make here is that a rule of law conception of preventing arbitrary government is still usually theorised or exemplified by looking at the impacts of government powers on our individual rights. And those kind of understandings of the rule of law that underpin our jurisprudence don't sit easily with the architecture of the Act in particular in determining whether the government is acting lawfully in preparing policies that will enable carbon budgets to be met under Section 13, tension arises between what the Act prescribes and the conventional policy-making discretion of government. Now, there are some promising signs that the Act's architecture is impacting on structures in government, um, which we can talk about in questions. Um, but the full scope of the, Act's duty, of the Act's duty to align government policy with carbon budgets and targets enters into a domain of policy making conventionally reserved for executive action and in relation to which courts conventionally have been reluctant to tread. So I think the case that you're very interested in, Chair, um, that's currently before the courts brought by Friends of the Earth, Client, Earth and the Good Law Project about the government's compliance with Section 13 will show us how willing courts will be to scrutinise and closely judge government policy making for its level of um, climate ambition, which is the real crux of the accountability question that many campaigners and people currently have about the Act. To conclude, and not talking about the two other tensions that I think are there, but I think they are there, these four different in aspects of the rule of law um, raise significant questions about how we conceptualise the Act as a form of law, and they go some way to explaining frustrations with its implementation. It's not an act that sets out simple rules of conduct executable by administrative officials on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a collective statute that robustly constrains government policy making for the common good. It's both a bold statement of the rule of law as a piece of legislation and a form of law which our jurisprudence does not have all the answers for. And having my argument is having better theoretical argument, uh, answers about the Act is not only important for understanding our law, which is inherently intrinsically a good thing, but it's crucially important for uh, ensuring that we have adequate institutional structures for its implementation. I will stop there. Well, thank you very much. Um, sorry to have been the enormous amount there to discuss, and it's a shame you're not here to be able to discuss it, because I suspect we're not going to have time in this session. But we now have to move on to Andrew Jackson, if he's I, there, as I hope he is. He's Assistant Professor of Environmental Law at University College Dublin, practicing solicitor, and in particular involved in the um, climate case, Ireland case before the Supreme Court of Ireland, which we talked about a bit yesterday. So, um, Andrew, if you're there, you've got, I'm afraid, really just until one o'clock by our time, but um, I hope you can cover your material in that time. Over to you. Thank you. So I want to speak about the Irish experience of framework climate laws, asking the question, are, are such laws merely symbolic or is there something more in, in the Irish experience? Now, the first thing is about Ireland as a so-called climate laggard historically 
Ireland's Taoiseach Leo, then Taoiseach Leo Varadkar back in 2018 said, I'm not proud of Ireland's performance on climate change. We are a laggard. And that's borne out uh, by the facts. Ireland has the third highest greenhouse gas emissions per capita in Europe. And Ireland's emissions increased by about 6% between 1990 and 2020, when many other countries saw very deep reductions over that period. In terms of framework climate laws in Ireland, there are three that I'm going to discuss. The first is a bill from 2010, which did not ultimately become law, which I'll, I'll mention for reasons that, that we'll see in a moment. Then the 2015 Act itself, which is Ireland's version, if you will, of the UK's Climate Change Act 2008. And the last piece of legislation I'll mention is an amendment act from last year, which amended the, the 2015 act in various ways. Now, a consistent thread running through all of this legislation is on the one hand, a desire to be responsible for creating national framework climate legislation, coupled on the other hand with attempts to make that legislation difficult or impossible to enforce in court, to make it merely symbolic, to sort of litigation proof the legislation, if you will. And that raises obvious issues for, in terms of the rule of law. And I've picked out some items from the World Justice Project's definition of the rule of, uh, uh, rule of law here, you know, seeking to limit oversight of government uh, action in this way um, could mean that exercise of government power is ineffectively constrained. The law may not be effectively enforced or enforceable. Rights may not be effectively guaranteed and access to justice may not be provided. So looking first at the 2010 uh, bill, which came um, in the wake really of the UK's act, you know, th there was of course the um, Friends of the Earth's Big Ask campaign in the United Kingdom leading to the 20, 2008 Act, which then that campaign then rolled out across Europe, including Ireland. And the 2010 bill was a relatively ambitious legislative attempt. The Green Party was in coalition power in Ireland for the first time at that time, and it was a Green Party minister who brought forward this bill. But the government collapsed before the law could be enacted after the EU IMF bailout. And an interesting feature of this bill was that the targets, the numerical mitigation targets in the bill and the National Climate Change Plan were to be expressly non-justiciable. And you can see the provision here, um, which I, I've quoted in full. As Conor Linehan commented uh, afterwards, targets were to be omitted from the legislation because of concerns within the Attorney General's office regarding the government or indeed future governments being hauled into court. And that's a consistent refrain over the years in Ireland. And as Wine and comments, it's difficult to think of any other prior legislative effort in Ireland in any sphere where such a direct ouster of the court's jurisdiction was attempted. Now, moving forward, it then took a further five years before a Climate Act was ultimately enacted in Ireland. And I, I think of the 2015 Act in its original form as being a bit like the UK's Climate Act, only with good bits removed. For example, the 2015 omitted numerical targets altogether. So no numerical 2050 targets, no interim targets. In their place, we had a vague national transition objective, plus a separate policy statement of Ireland's mitigation goal, which at this time was an 80% reduction by 2050. And that sat outside the act. And as the minister of the time, Phil Hogan here, uh, said himself, he'd been advised not to put targets in the legislation in order to avoid, as he said, being in and out of the courts every other week. Now, I think it's fair to say that this did not exactly go according to plan, because in 2017, an NGO called Friends of the Irish Environment uh, judicially reviewed the first national mitigation plan. And that, as you know, ended in the Supreme Court in 2020 with a unanimous judgment delivered by the Chief Justice, holding that the National Mitigation Plan 
falls well short of the requirements of the Act. And two uh, comments that I just want to flag in terms of this judici justiciability question. Um, the Chief Justice said, what might once have been policy has become law by virtue of the enactment of the 2015 Act. What might well have been a non-justiciable question of policy clearly became justiciable because both a policy, i.e. the national transition objective for 2050, and the need to specify how that policy was to be achieved became matters of law by virtue of the 2015 Act. In the wake of that judgment, and with the Green Party back in government, various improvements have been made to the 2015 Act. It was amended uh, last year, so we have a net zero target by 2050. There's an interim target of a 51% reduction in emissions by 2030 compared to the annual level in 2018. We have a strengthened advisory council. Uh, there's an interesting general obligation on the government to act consistently with the UN Framework Convention and Paris Agreement objectives, for example, in adopting carbon budgets, and that's something that may be litigated in the future. But interestingly, old, old habits die hard, and the 2021 Amendment Act introduces a new limitation provision into the Act. Uh, and you can see it here, for the avoidance of doubt, no remedy or relief by way of damages um, or compensation is available with respect to or arising out of any failure of whatever kind to comply with any provision of this Act or any obligation or duty created thereunder. And I, I mean, I think that raises interesting questions around whether an effective remedy is provided, for example, for infringement of rights under the European uh, Convention on Human Rights. And that's an, another question that may potentially be litigated into the future. Lessons from the Irish experience, then, I think. We can see that framework climate laws can play an important enabling role when it comes to pushing for increased ambition and action, even where the law has been designed to minimize enforcement possibilities. And we can see this enabling role in various ways in Ireland, first in terms of the institutions and the architecture created, for example, the requirement to produce regular mitigation and adaptation plans, the creation of an independent climate change advisory council, which the, the Supreme Court interestingly has given some teeth. He said the Supreme Court in Climate Case Ireland said, although the government isn't bound by the views of the advisory council, it's appropriate to place significant weight on the council's views, which by the way, was set up under the same statute as the plan um, was made under, which was being challenged in court. Significantly in the Irish contract, context, the opportunities for litigation created by a climate act are very important, I think. Um, and if we look at the outcomes of the litigation in Ireland, the outcomes of Climate Case Ireland, we have a new improved climate uh, plan and significantly revised national climate legislation. And that flows down into practical impacts on the ground. So Ireland's only coal-fired power station is to, is to close, to be replaced with a large renewable energy hub. And in a major change in land use, really a monumental in the Irish context change in land use, Ireland's semi-state peat company has exited peat extraction altogether and launched a large-scale rehabilitation uh, plan for its peatlands. Movement building, uh, also an important feature of the litigation that was enabled by the Climate Act. Uh, we see the climate case was a focal point really for campaigners to uh, coalesce and, and galvanize around. And uh, there's lots of evidence I could give of, of that, but this is an interesting quote from Ireland's now climate change minister who attended the final day of the High Court hearing in Climate Case Ireland. And as, as he describes the scene, I've never seen anything like it. Babies and toddlers, young and old, spread politely on the court floor, wrapped in attention to the proceedings. It would make you proud of our Republic. And really this was an extraordinary um, scene that brought together disparate elements, I would say, in the environmental movement and allowed them to coalesce around something and, and, and the movement really grew. The litigation has also allowed um, there to be now, I think, an established dialogue about climate change between Europe's highest courts. The Urgenda decision of the Supreme Court in the Netherlands was important in the Irish litigation and the Irish Supreme Court's judgment in turn and the Supreme Court's uh, judgment in, in agenda 
were important in the German Federal Constitutional Court's decision in Neubauer. And the German court said, uh, cited Climate Case Ireland judgment as of prime relevance to, to one of the central findings in that case. And I think that um, really is, you know, the, the, the act enabled the litigation in Ireland, and that litigation in turn has, has helped to lead to this uh, dialogue between your courts. So in conclusion then, I mean, whether and to what extent framework climate laws in fact have the effect of enabling increased ambition and action, I think may depend on numerous factors beyond mere political will. The first is that, of course, the precise terms of the law in question, and I, I don't really have time to unpack that, but that's really very important, I think. The ability to access justice at national level, questions of standing costs and so on, the ingenuity of public interest litigants, and equally importantly, the receptiveness of courts to such uh, litigants' arguments. And I think I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Spot on time. That was very well done <laughs> and a very interesting contribution. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much to our speakers. I thought that was very stimulating and sorry we couldn't speak that off. <laughs>